That's what this conference is all about. And, you know, we have a great start time and a great finish time, but yet this is just really the beginning as we seek to move forward for the cause of Christ. We want to do more this next year than we did last year for the cause of world evangelization. And so just as the guy's saying, you know, will you pray? Will you give? Will you go? Because there's a world out there that really needs to have what we say we have, which is the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. You know, there's that little verse of scripture that says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? And yet we have a lot of times where we get distracted into other avenues of life and we forget the main thing. And we as a church need to keep the main thing the main thing. Amen. And I'm glad the Lord sent the Moors with us. Brother Moore is going to come right now and preach for us. Amen. Wow, the end of the conference. I tell you, I meet tonight with a mixed emotions. Uh, not that I want to keep preaching, although I love that, but I just like to stay here, except for the weather. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Well, now shall I repeat that? Okay. But you know what, what he said is so true. I have not spoke on money this week. I haven't talked about giving. But these missionaries that are here tonight cannot do what they need to do, what they've been called to do, unless we, you, do what you're supposed to do. And that is to give, to be a part of sharing in that. And uh, the ones that can't go can help send those who want to go and will go and are willing to go. So let me encourage you to think about what the Lord's done to you, with you and through you last year and how you trusted him and how he blessed you. Can you trust him just a little bit more this year? Put a little more faith into it and give. And I, I know that the Lord will bless you in all your efforts. It's been a joy for my wife and I to be here. Uh, I'm going to tell you, that song service tonight wore me out. I love to sing, and I'm not good at it, as I said the other night, but I just love to, to sing. You know, and wor worship ought to work. It ought to be a labor, isn't it? You know, I, I think that when we come together and to worship the Lord, uh, it ought not just be to sit and, and to go through the motions. It ought to be a, a labor of getting involved and doing the best. If you sing, sing to the loudest you can sing. Blast Brother Matt off the pulpit. But do it with a joy in your heart and uh, give it to him. Well, take your Bibles tonight as we close out and turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians, if you will. I've been praying about what to close out this meeting with. And God has blessed us, I think, uh, your spirit, uh, your attentiveness, uh, your faithfulness. Uh, it has been an encouragement to me as I look out uh, I see smiles, and that encourages you. Uh, it, when your preacher preaches, you ought to smile at him. You ought to nod your head. And, 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 and I don't know how it is here, but I like to hear amen. Thank you. Amen just simply means I agree. That's it. And so uh, if you hear something that you agree with, don't be afraid. The, the building will not fall in. And uh, say what you need to. All right. First Thessalonians chapter 1, if you will, please join me in standing as I read. Paul's writing to the church at Thessalonica in verse number uh, 2 of chapter 1. He says, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of, our, of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were assembles unto all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, 
not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad so that we need not speak anything. What a wonderful testimony of a wonderful church. Let's pray, shall we? Our Father, Lord, it has so been so good to be in this place this week. Lord, uh, you've revived my heart. You've encouraged me through these wonderful, wonderful folks. And Lord, this truly is, as I st- said, I believe on the first night, a miracle church. We're thankful for that. We praise you for what you've done here. And Lord, I believe that the work has just begun. There's much yet to be done. And so, Lord, tonight as we close this conference, let it, as the pastor said just a moment ago, not be the end, but be the beginning of what you're going to do in the future. Lord, bless us tonight. Meet with us. Use us, we pray. And we thank you and we'll praise you already for what you'll do. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The book of 1 Thessalonians is an exciting book, and it has five chapters, and every chapter, of course, uh, is a a section on its own, and uh, it has a reference of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 1, we find uh, the the idea of the return and salvation. In chapter 2, we find uh, the idea of the return and service. In chapter 3, we find the idea of being of the return and stability of staying uh, by the stuff. Uh, In chapter 4, we find the return and uh, with the idea of separation. And then the last chapter, we find the idea of return and sanctification. And as you read the chapter 1, it almost seems like what God did was take all of the best of all of the people, all of those Christians in those areas, and place them into this one church. Because you find that that church is one of the most solid and devoted churches uh, in this time period. period. It could be said that the church was a pattern of churches to other churches that it could have been what we would classify maybe in its own time a miracle church. And uh, I believe it was. Uh, This is the kind of church that I think every church ought to desire to have. It ought to be the kind of church that every church labors at and prays for and endeavors to be a part of and to make their church to be what it is. Now, may I say to you, some years ago, uh, Dr. Burge uh, talked with me and he said, you know, Jim, I was just at a church up in a little town in Manitoba, Canada. And he said, man, i never seen a place like that. Amen. He said it was a wonderful church. And I said, oh, man, that's good. Well, my mind is uh, uh, maybe 50 or 60, 70 people and uh, a good church, but uh, nothing, you know, out of the ordinary. Uh, some years later, I had the privilege of meeting your pastor at a meeting. And then after that, was asked to come and speak the first year. Now, I'll be honest, when I came, I didn't expect to see what I saw. When I came, uh, uh, back then they had the long, narrow uh, auditorium. And uh, I was amazed at the size of the auditorium. But what really scared me was when it was full. And I looked at all those people. I, I came from a church of about 100. And so, and I came and I looked at all those people and they wanted to hear something good. And they're looking at me like, uh-huh. you know, like Daniel in the lion's den is what I felt like. Uh, but I sensed then that this church had only begun to do what God wanted it to do. And it's exciting to come back some years later and to see it flourishing the new buildings and the new programs and all that God has blessed you with and to see some faces that were here back in those days when I was here before and to see that they're still here serving God. Let me tell you something, this truly is a miracle church. And I want to just share with you what Paul is writing to the church of Thessalonica and why he called this church or why I believe he called this church a model church. Notice, I think, first of all, that they were a pattern or a model in their position. Look at verse number one 
if you will. I did not read that. It says, Paul and Sabinius and Timotheus unto the church of Thessalonica, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to understand, the New Testament church uh, this church it was a pattern in their position because the Bible says that they were in Christ. In Christ. The New Testament uses the phrase in Christ about 70 times, a little over 70 times. And this is the, uh, the only place where there is true safety, amen, is in the position of being in Christ. The church at Thessalonica was in Christ. It's possible to be in a church but not in Christ. And I said that, uh, I think, a couple of days ago. I think every one of us needs to look at ourselves and to make sure that we are in Christ. And I know that from the testimonies I've heard, from the, the, the fellowship, from the Spirit in this place, I would say, and I don't know, I can't see your heart, but I would say that most, if not all, have trusted Christ as their Savior. Now, if you're here tonight and you don't know that, you're not in Christ. And I hope that you will make sure of that. But this church was in Christ. It's the safest place you can be. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And that's the exciting thing about it. When I, when I was saved that day that I walked out of that shop and went to church and heard my, my need of being saved and, and uh, how I was lost and God began to work in my heart and I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, I got in Christ and I became a new creature. Old things passed away, the old desires, the old uh, habits, and all the rest of it. And uh, what an exciting thing. Oh, when I, I got saved, uh, I was a sailor, and I'm not proud of all that. My language was sailor language. And when I'd go back into the shop, and, and uh, uh, that bothered me. And so I said to, to the Holy Spirit, I said, Holy Spirit, do something for me. I said, when I'm about to say something that would be displeasing to you with a word or language, would you just snap your fingers or slap me side to head or whatever and just say, watch it. And you know what? Every time, every time, God just worked in life because I was in Christ. And what it is. Now, to be in Christ means that they, these, this church was in the safest place it could be. Safest place. In our states, uh, down around Oklahoma, they have these deadly tornadoes that come through and literally wipe out cities, uh, just destroy everything. And they say that the safest place that you can be during that time is that many of those people would go out into the yard or in the garage and they would dig down into the ground and build a tornado shelter. And when the warnings would come, they would literally be in that shelter with uh, the, the, the door closed above them. And even if they lost their home, it would not affect them. They were safe in that shelter. And that's exactly what it's talking about. Being in Christ is the safest place that we can be. Nothing can reach me unless it goes through him first. This church was in Christ. It was that. Satan is trying to destroy the church today. Satan is trying to disrupt the church today. Satan is trying to tear away the church today. And the safest place that we can be is in Christ. They were in the safest place. And then they were in the most sustained place. When the devil attacks the church, he's attacking God himself. Would you take your Bibles and turn back to the book of Acts? Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Look at verse number 4. And he's talking about Paul. And he says, And he fell to earth and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now, remember, Paul was out to disrupt the church. Paul was binding Christians and sending them to, to prisons and all the rest. And in doing that, he was literally persecuting the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so the, the sustained place that we can be in is it. God made it very clear to Paul that that's what he was doing. And when the church is in Christ, God will sustain that church. I want you to understand, we are living in a day when many churches are being shut down. Many churches are being uh, persecuted and closed around the world. And the safest place is to be where he is. Matthew chapter 16 verse 18 says this, Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. Oh, I tell you, when you're in Christ, and the church is in Christ, it's the safest place you can be. The pattern is that they were in Christ. Then, notice also, they were a modern church because of their praise. Look at verse number 2. Paul says this, he says, We give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers. Paul here uh, could not say enough about this church. He could not say enough about the, what they were doing. He could not say enough about how they were uh, working, how, how their faith was, and all the rest. I don't know how many times I have used Pemina Valley Baptist Church as an example or a, a testimony to others and encouraging them that God can do great and mighty things even in the frozen north. Yeah. Amen. God is not limited. God can use a wonderful group of people to do great and mighty things. And Paul just could not. He praised them for who they were. They were brothers and sisters in Christ. And they were fellow soldiers for the cause of Christ. And that's what you are. You know, it's amazing to me. I love this idea and thought. It does not matter where we are. It does not matter our backgrounds. In Christ, we are one family. And in Christ, we are fellow soldiers of the cross of Christ, amen, with one goal, one mission, and that is to win the loss to the Lord Jesus Christ and then to mature those that have been saved. He was praising them for who they were. Then he praised them for how they were. They received the word of God readily and with excitement. And as I look out tonight and as I've looked out this week, I see smiles on your face. I see people nodding their head. I don't know if maybe they're going to sleep. But uh, I see heads being nodded. I, I see amens. I hear amens. What that is is that you are really readily accepting and listening to the Word of God. What an exciting thing to do. And that's what he was praising them for. They were a pattern of a uh, model in their praise that others would give to them. And then notice that they were a pattern or a model in their performance. Look at verse number 6. It says, And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. You know, there was an old Timex commercial on TV as I was a younger, and it said uh, that a Timex watch will take a beating and keep on ticking, amen, and how true that is. This church that we're talking about here in Thessalonica received the word, as it says, in much affliction, but with the joy of the Holy Ghost with the joy of the Holy Ghost. There was a little chorus that we used to sing when I was younger. It used to be, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. And how wonderful it is to have that joy of the Lord. doesn't matter how we receive the Word of God. And we can receive it in affliction. We can receive it in joy and gladness. But we ought to be happy over what we hear and how God speaks to us. One of the signs of a great church is that when affliction comes... The members don't pack up and move down the street to some church looking for greater, greener pastures. Amen. They stick with it. They pray through it. They labor through it. They trust God to do some things. They follow the leadership through it. And God blesses that church. And he will honor that church. In their performance, they did that. Yes, this church was going through some real persecution. And yet they received the word of God with the joy of the Holy Ghost. They kept on serving. They kept on attending. They kept on praying. And what a joy that is. You know, someone once said this, the mark of a great person is not what it takes to keep them going, but rather what it takes to get them to quit. And how true it is. Someone once said, as we're talking about giving, 
that we ought to give until it hurts. The only trouble with that is some people get hurt quicker than others. The mark is not that it hurts. It's what does God want us to give, amen? This church would not quit. It kept on going, and God used it. And then they were a pattern in their purity. Look at verse 9. It says, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. When these folks got saved, they reflected that they were saved. They left the things of idolatry. They served the true and living God. They once served dead gods, idols, and all the rest. But now they found the truth and they got involved in it. You know, that's what we try to do when we get into missions. The, uh, the folks that work with the Jews, they're serving uh, other things, and they haven't known the true Messiah, and they need to turn to that. The, the Word of God that's being printed is to let people know that there is a true and living God. The folks that are going to the Philippines, they're, they're going to, to turn the people from that, as we heard the other night, uh, uh, from their pagan thoughts and the things that they have done to true to serve the living God. That's exactly what we need to do. This church true, truly showed their uh, pattern and the model of purity. Even though they, uh, the, the stand would cost them and bring them probably persecution, they were not ashamed to live for Christ before the world that was around them. When I was in the Navy, I like to talk about my Navy. I'm sorry, it's part of my history. It might bore you, but I love it. I had the privilege of my goal, my goal was to make chief. And uh, that happened. I made chief. Well, in the Navy, when you made chief, you were to go through what they called an initiation. You had to go to the chief's club, and it was really a drunken uh, thing. You were fined with... Uh, uh, certain charges brought against you and you pay money for that and then that money was used to buy the alcohol and all the rest. And uh, I had been saved about a year or so and uh, when that came, I really prayed about it because I knew I couldn't do that. And so I, I uh, told him I, I can't go through the initiation. Well, if you're a chief in the Navy, it's kind of like a big brotherhood. In other words, you have to be through that initiation, and that's what supposedly makes you a real chief, you know. You're a part of it. You're one of us. And I can remember for days and days, oh, I never got beat up. I never got in a fight. But, boy, I w it was made miserable for me. Day in, day out, uh, everybody just criticized me. And I had guys come up that were supposedly Christians and said, now, Jim, let me tell you, we'll go with you. And uh, whatever you can't do, uh, uh, we, we'll just go by that. We won't let you get involved in things you can't do. And I said, well, let me ask you this. I said, are they going to still find me? Well, yeah, they're going to find you the money. And I said, what's that money go for? Well, it's to buy alcohol. I said, well, I can't do that. And I, they said, well, what kind of initiation do you want? And I said, how about if we go to the chapel and I'll have my preacher come and preach? Amen. I don't think we can do that. <laughs> and so one day I went into the shop and a call came down from my uh, commander, department head. He said, uh, the department commander wants to see you in his office. And I said, oh, boy. So I started going up the, the stairs, and as I did, I prayed, and I said, Lord, I'm trying to be strong. I'm trying to do right. I'm trying to be what I know I should be. I just need you to help me in this. And I walked into the commander's office, and standing there, and he looked at me, and he said, uh, said I understand you chose not to go through the initiation. And I said, well, sir, I said, I have convictions that I can't do that. And he said, okay, we'll promote you here in my office. No problem. We'll get it all done here. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, God blessed 
Now, it wasn't like these folks. It wasn't being physically persecuted. It wasn't torment. But I'll tell you what. It was an, an example to the young men around me that I was willing to take a stand. Amen. You know, none of us, I don't believe, are being beaten up for our cause of Christ today, taking a stand. But somewhere along the way, we're going to have to determine what or where we're going to stand. What is it that's more important? This church determined that it was going to take a stand. It was going to turn from serving idols. Yes, it might cause some persecution. Yes, it might cause some family to disown us. Yes, it might take me to be ostracized from community. It might mean that we are going to have a hard time in surviving. But we're going to take a stand and we're going to turn from idols to serve the true and living God. And how important that is. I think I said the other day uh, in one of my messages that our daughters had a teacher and her favorite saying was every day when the kids left that room you're either a missionary or a mission field and how true that is whenever we go out into the world we're either going to be a missionary or we're part of the mission field and then lastly notice that this church was a, a pattern a model in their propagation look at verse number 8 it says for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. They didn't just get up on Sunday morning and sing, throw out the lifeline. They threw out the lifeline. They didn't just get up on Sunday morning and sing, send the light. They sent the light. They just didn't get up on Sunday morning and sing, we've a story to tell to the nations. They told the story to the nations. They just didn't get up on Sunday morning and sing, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. They let their light shine to a lost and dying world. They just didn't stop in their area. Their testimony spread all over. God used that church to be an encouragement to other churches. They were and I believe they are a pattern for missions today. That's what this church is. When I think of this church, when I read this passage of Scripture, and I don't want you to get prideful. Don't get prideful. Don't let the devil build you to a place where you think, boy, we're really something. But I do want to say this. If you'll stay humble, if you'll stay in the will of God, God has used this church to encourage other churches. God has used this church to excite other churches. God has used this church to be a pattern, to be a model of missions to other churches. And it's exciting for me to see what God will do and to think what God will do through you in this next year and in the future for world evangelism and for winning the lost as you stay humble for him. Too many, are, too many today are content with just giving missions dollars and certainly we need missions dollars. Missionaries need to have those funds to be sent. But the command to us is to go ye into all the world and to preach the gospel. It's our responsibility to raise up that white flag that I said a while ago at the very beginning and say, Lord, if you will, what a privilege it would be for me to carry the gospel to a people who need to hear it and to be a part of the wonderful missions around the world. But if you won't call me, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll take this and I'll lay it on the altar and say, God, you use that to send someone else in my place so that they can hear the gospel. When I read this passage of scripture, I think of Pemina Valley Baptist Church. God is using you. God is blessing you. Don't take for granted what you have here because it's not everywhere. 
And God has used this church in many, many ways. I guess the question we have to ask ourselves, because this church certainly, I believe, is a model church, miracle church. I think we have to ask ourselves, are we truly in Christ? Do you know for sure that you're saved tonight? Or are you just in the church? Are you worthy of the praise of God when he looks down on this church? Are you involved in it to the place where you're worthy of it? Are you performing as you ought to perform? And are you as burdened for the souls of men around the world as God would have us to be burdened? A model church, a great responsibility, but oh, what a privilege to be a part of. Covet what God is doing here. Pray for what God is doing here. I'll tell you, it has been an encouragement to me to go into that room up there with these men and to pray. And I think if more churches did that, there'd be a greater, greater movement. Collective prayer is important. Individual prayer is important. Let's move forward on our knees for the cause of Christ. What does God want you to do? Are you willing to say, Lord, here am I, send me, use me, help me to be what you want me to be? I'm willing to go if you'll call me. And if not, Lord, I'm willing to give as you impress upon me so that others can go and others can hear the great gospel story. Let's pray. Father, I just wanted to share a challenge tonight. Lord, I just thank you so much for the privilege that we've had to be here. Thank you for this church. Thank you for all the blessings that we have received, every missionary. And yet, Lord, I believe there's a great cause yet to be done. I believe, Lord, that uh, we have yet to touch the hem of the garment. And Lord, I pray that through this week and through the weeks ahead, that you would use Pemina Valley Baptist Church to do more for missions than they've ever done. That more would surrender their lives and to be willing to go. That more would be willing to get involved in sharing the responsibility of sending others to go. That God together, to working together, souls would be saved, lives would be salvaged, hearts would be changed, and heaven would would be filled. Bless, I pray. Help us, Lord. And we thank you. We praise you for all that you are. With heads bowed, eyes closed, let's stand to our feet, shall we? Maybe tonight you ought to just come and say, Lord, thank you for allowing me to be a part of Pemina Valley Baptist Church. Thank you for this church and what it's meant in my life. And Lord, how can I encourage to build, to strengthen this church? Maybe you need to come tonight and say, Lord, I need to surrender. Just make myself available to be what you'd want me to be in the matter of missions. Maybe tonight somebody might have to come and say, Lord, I'm not in the church or in Christ. I'm in the church. Whatever's needed tonight.